So, Steve Malaxos, welcome to the show. Of course, this is a recorded interview. In real time, it's now about 3.20, Saturday, May 14th. East Fremantle is playing Claremont. It's half time. According to your game plan, where should the Sharks be now? Uh, the game plan, we should be about 10 goals in front, but we're probably not. Are you also a comedian? <laughs> He's the very new coach at East Fremantle. Year one, anxious to do well, and no doubt will. You see, Steve Malaxos is genetically programmed to make his mark. His family comes from Castellarizzo, the island that's given us a state governor, a lord mayor, a sports presenter, and many, many more. He's played, he's coached, he's won awards, and he's travelled. Claremont, East Fremantle, Hawthorne, West Coast, Sydney Swans, and the Dockers. You could say that the Malaxos football career is peripatetic. From the Greek, of course. I played junior football all my life um, in the Claremont zone. Uh, we only lived, well, a mile, <laughs> 1.6k from almost exactly from Claremont Oval. Uh, and I, I used to go and watch Claremont every single week from when I was about five or six years of age. And when I mean every single week, I, I literally mean every week. I, I never missed a game, even if I was crook. Catch the train to Bassendine, get off at Success Hill or whatever it is, catch the two trains to Lath Lane Park. Um, and I never missed a game. Claremont weren't all that successful when I was watching them, but I, um, I had the thought, I remember vividly, that all I want to do is play one league game for Claremont. And if I played one league game, I would have been happy. I, I just want to run out there once. And That's very limiting. Yeah, it was, yeah. But in all seriousness, that's, that was the... Um, but you did much more major, than that. I did, yeah. Much that was more a, than that. That was my major goal, yeah. and uh, everything else has been way beyond what I ever um, really, really dreamed of doing. I actually barracked for Hawthorne, so it was like, wow, I'm, I'm going to go to Melbourne and play for the team I barracked for. But uh, yeah, things didn't quite work out as planned. It was one of those years where um, yeah. everything that could could go wrong sort did of wrong. did. Yeah. You, you played, what, nine senior games? Yeah, I played nine. Um, what went wrong? I started off okay and then I um, came down with chicken pox and I played uh, Sydney Swans at the Sydney with chicken pox um, and I, I played just okay but you judged, no one cares, you, you judged on how you perform um, and then I missed the next couple of weeks, got crook and it sort of all unravelled from there. So how do you look back at those Hawthorne years as, as, as a failure? Um, Oh, look, I probably, you know, I probably would be remembered by the, by Hawthorne or the wider community as a, uh, as a failure or certainly a failure. But I've got a more philosophical approach to it. Um, the, the people I met at Hawthorne during that era, um, it's held me in good stead for the rest of my life. So in a, in a, in a development of your your life sense, it was a real positive. That just the footy side of things didn't really work out. In those days, being captain of the Eagles didn't. Have, when I was the captain, it didn't seem a big deal. But now, you, I think, gee, Darren Glass is the captain. He's like a, an icon of the, the state. But um, yeah, it, it's a real feather in your cap, I guess, and it, it helps you. Yeah. But that captain year didn't end too well either, did it? No, no. It what was, happened there? It was going well. Um, I ended up having an overall a reasonable year. I think I came about fifth in the, the best and fairest that year. But you didn't play in the finals. N I played in a couple of finals, but my form started tapering off towards the end. I, I think fundamentally I just got tired. Um, I think uh, playing midfield all year. Um, but I'm intrigued by a quote, Steve, that I read about that time. Yeah. It said, and things turned sour. Yeah. What did that mean? Probably more to do with the relationship between me and, and Mick Malthouse at the time. What was that relationship? Um, when you're captain, I was captain and he was the coach, you, you, you're relatively close to, to the coach, but Mick's the sort of coach you never, at that point, never really um, allowed a player to get real close to him. But we had a pretty good relationship, I felt, but uh, 
the dropping, the nature of it, what occurred around that time, how I handled it, how he handled it, meant that um, we barely spoke for How did you handle months. it? Um, in a lot of ways, not well. I, I was really, I, I was disappointed beyond being disappointed, if that makes any sense. It, uh, um, I, I was that, I was that disappointed for days I could hardly talk to anyone and didn't want to talk to anyone. So I, I ended up shutting myself off from a lot of people and friends and that would try to, in a way, open up, come around for a drink or come around, why don't we catch up for lunch? And I, I was just say, no, I, I don't want to. Um, so, it, so it was my, my own fault. I, sh I shouldn't have been like that and it would, would have helped. And also there was no mechanisms at that time at, in footy for now when a player gets dropped, there's a support network around the club, an assistant coach will speak to you, might even be the sports psychologist if the club has one, the leadership group. At that time I was basically dropped and you handle it however you can. So Malthouse dropped you? Yeah, it was a Wednesday night and um, put it this way, I was in the, in the showers with a few other players and uh, one of the players got called out, Dean Irving, and he got dropped. And then I got called out, and I, as I put the towel around me, I thought this doesn't sound very promising. And I uh, walked in the room. There was a whole, there was a whole match committee, and um, that they said you dropped for these reasons. Um, you know, the, the, their their honesty and bluntness was um, was something in retrospect I respect. So there was no. So there you are, standing in a towel. Oh, I'll put a shirt on. <laughs> being told a, you are dropped. Dropped from the, the finals and not to, not to tell anyone, uh, which was interesting because my parents, um, or my, my dad would, had booked a flight to come over because it was a final, so I was meant to, not to tell anyone. Uh, but I ended up telling my wife and, um, and parents and, and word leaked out uh, from that. Um, and by Friday I was in the in the Noor again because word had leaked out and Mick, Mick called me in on Friday and said he's really disappointed that people had found out that I'd been dropped. So I, I, um, all those, it was just a pretty, it was a pretty bizarre couple of days actually, in S retrospect. So how do you get over something like that, which is monumental really? Yeah, it is, uh, and I actually never played another game of AFL football. So the, that day I was dropped, I went from being captain of a team that was in the finals to never playing AFL footy again. I, I do think back to it from time to time and I'm probably a little bit like Hawthorne, I sort of put it in its compartment and uh, philosophise about it a bit and think it's just one of those things in life that you, you try and learn from. And, and certainly as a coach, um, the one thing I have learned is if I do drop a player, um, I'll try to be as communicative as, as possible. Which did not happen with you? Uh, not at that time. Did no, Malthouse no. tell you anything? I told me the reasons why I was dropped. Which were? Um, they were playing on a big ground um, and uh, I wasn't the quickest player going around and they needed to load the side up with pace um, on a big ground. It was, we were playing at White, West Coast were playing at Waverley. Yeah, but that's just not playing in one team. You were actually dropped then completely. Yeah, I, well, they won easily and, uh, you know, didn't change winning time team and then I think they'd moved on I was, was there over pre-season, but they'd moved on in, in, in how they were thinking about the team. So it was, I think deep down, they probably thought I was still a reasonable player, but they'd, in how they wanted to develop the side, they'd moved on from, from how I played. So it, it was a little bit circumstantial, but, but now coaching, I can relate more to... Um, You've learned from that. I've learned from that, and I can relate more to mm. what, what the selectors and what, what Mick were thinking, yeah. The 2000s, if you like, have been the, the least successful in East Fremantle's history. Um, the, we won a premiership in that period and we haven't won a final for about eight or nine years. So um, it, it was, it's really about delivering um, a more successful, or helping deliver a more successful period and keeping a balance with um, developing our young players. We've got a great record for developing young players and getting them drafted, so making sure that still occurs. But there are degrees of success, Steve. Yes. What is the achievement for this year that you've said, I can get you? Um, we're, we're aiming to play finals and, uh, and win finals, yeah.
good luck.